my learning to work with other people um, is really about appreciation. And I, I think as a network guy and then also as a producer, my job is to have my eyes open to find vision. And I don't have to have the vision, but I need to be able to identify it. And then when I identify it, I need to nurture it and I need to protect it. And so that's not being the loudest voice in the room. That's listening, understanding, and finding community of artists. That's really satisfying to me. Welcome to the sag After Foundation and the Business Online Program. I'm an actor. My name is Bob Balaban. If you're interested in programming like this from the sag After Foundation, please consider liking this video and subscribing to our YouTube channel. And now it is my greatest pleasure to introduce producer Warren Littlefield. Hi, Warren. Hello, Bob. It's great to see you again. I haven't seen you for a couple of years. I miss you, Bob. It's well, I, wonderful to see you. Thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad we're almost here together. So Warren, in case you didn't know, it, is the founder and president of the Littlefield Company, whose shows have garnered so many Emmys, Golden Globes, and Producers Guild Awards. I can't, I can't count that high. Full disclosure, <laughs> he's also a friend of mine. My wife and I met Warren sometime in the 70s and worked on developing a TV series that didn't happen but we didn't hold it against him. I really didn't, Warren. But I don't remember much about that show. Do you have any memory of it? Do you even know what happened? I think it was ahead of its time, Bob, and that was its flaw. I'm sure that you and I were on the cutting edge, um, along with uh, Lynn, and the world wasn't ready for us. Well, that's a really good way of putting it. I love that. Whether, whether it's true or not, I, I don't know, but I like it. <laughs> okay, good. I'm going to batter you with a couple of easy questions. Where did you grow up, Warren? I never found, I never knew anything about your childhood. I grew up in Montclair, New Jersey, um, in a very middle class household. Um, and my dad was a salesman for H.J. Hines Company. We called him a pickle pusher. Um, and my mom was a housewife, uh, but uniquely, I grew up with both grandmothers in my home as well. Wow. So, and a sister. So a quiet dad and um, then all these women swirling in the household. Well, how old were you when you knew you were hooked on show business? Do you have, do you have any memory of that? I, I used to stay home a lot from school and I would be glued to the million dollar movie um, okay. coming out of um, WPIX in New York. Um, and I think I felt very attached and that the world was more interesting in what I was looking at on the television set than sitting in a classroom. And, and I think my mom wanted company. So I, I, early on, I felt like uh, there's something that's pulling me, pulling me into that world. Um, those wonderful movies take me to a place. Um, and so uh, I, I, let's see, Stanley Campbell came by one day and said, there's a rumor you're dead. <laughs> and that's when I thought I probably should, like, get back to school. So you weren't sick. You just felt oh. better staying at home. Yeah. He said, you know, I know you like staying at home, but like you probably should, like, they think you're dead. Did you ever want to be an actor or a director? Did, did you ever go in that direction? I did high school theater. Um, and so I think that that's exactly as far as I was ever meant to be. Um, a high school theater, um, I would not count on that ever being particularly good. Um, uh, but, but I love the process. I love being part of that community and I love that putting on a show. Um, and so that was exciting to me, but I don't think I was very good at acting. Did you suspect you were ever going to go in the direction you went in or was it the, was that a surprise for you, but actually deeply in your, in, in the seeds of your youth, 
it sounds like it really took root. Well, I, I think when I go back and look, that was where that core desire came from. But then, um, you know, it was the 70s. I, uh, I went off to college um, first in Washington, D.C., and um, got arrested at the May Day demonstrations, uh, for which I got right. credit in sociology. Right. Uh, and, um, and then I transferred to a small school in New York State, Hobart and William Smith Colleges, and I got a degree in psychology. And, and that felt good, and that felt right for the times. And I got out of there, and I thought, okay, I need a break. I need to like have a, a, a work experience. And I had, I, um, I put myself through school being a teamster, um, driving uh, big rigs in the tri-state area. Wow. And yeah, yeah, it was great. Um, and larger than life characters and, and a world. And, and I think it gave me a confidence that like I could do things. Um, and so um, I got out of school with a degree in psychology and thought, let's just, let's just go to work for a while. And then I was really dismayed at what that looked like in New York. And um, an ex-girlfriend's dad had a small production company and said, hey, we're, we're making this pilot. And if you want to be a gopher, you can be a gopher. And I was like, yeah, that seems like fun. And that was it. It was just this is what I want to do. I want to be a part of making content that took me back to some of those high school acting roots. Although I knew I should not be an actor. Um, I don't have the skills and qualities that you possess, Mr. Balaban. Um, and and oh, well, I, I think they're hiding in there. You, you just haven't found them yet. <laughs> well, uh, okay. You're being generous. Uh, so so yeah, so then I um, now did, I, I was did, I was infected by that um, creatively coming together um, with a team of people to to make content. Now, can you talk to me a little bit about the last giraffe and how I think it had something to do with bringing you to LA and NBC? Am I right? Uh, I, no, I don't, I don't think that helped me uh, get to NBC necessarily, but um, it got me out of New York into California. Um, so it was a, a book about saving an endangered species. Um, and I was like, all right, we can make this as a television movie of the week. Um, I knew that we were competing against much bigger players in the landscape. So I sold it to advertisers and then um and then somebody i'd never produced anything and it's they they actually said here's the money to go to east africa to go to kenya and make a movie of the week and it was wild and insane and fun and you know we got a 35 share we i don't it was it was a it's a nice movie it's a little movie but i had done it and then I, and then i had the opportunity to sell it um, throughout the world. And, um, and so that little production company that I'd worked for Westfall productions, that was the first time they had ever had profitability. And, and I think it was from that, that I was offered a job at Warner brothers television. And I went to work there in comedy development. Um, and I stayed for six months. Um, and then there was an opening at NBC Stuart Sheslow was working there and said, oh, I remember you, him. Yeah. He said, you should apply for this job. We have a job was an opening at, at NBC. And so I interviewed with Brandon Tartikoff and um, I reviewed four episodes that had not gone on the air yet of the facts of life. And, um, and I don't know, I guess I said the right things. They, um, I don't know how qualified I was, Bob, but they took a flyer on me. Well, you got to start somewhere. That's it. And, and so, um, so NBC had different strokes and hello, Larry, that was their comedy lineup. Um, ABC had 
14 comedies. CBS had a dozen and they were outstanding. Um, and so we started from nowhere, but um, it was a great learning tree because the cupboard was so bare at NBC. Um, and so that allowed me to uh, to grow and to learn. And, and I guess couldn't have gotten any worse than where they were. Um, so that was good timing. And I guess Brandon Tartikoff was some kind of mentor for you. He, he was helpful. He, he taught you. Yeah. And I, I think one of the great things that Brandon taught me was an absolute love of what we were doing. He was he was filled with a sly smile, glee over someone who was actually paying him to do this job. And um, and it was a great job because that's where content happened. Um, being able to listen to ideas, generate them sometimes, and be able to say to writers, directors, producers, actors, go do it. And, and um, his love of the business was infectious. And, and I, I got to really appreciate how, how wonderful uh, that experience could be uh, through his eyes. Um, and um, uh, that was, uh, it was a, it was a wonderful relationship. Well, that's a, a great and unusual boss as, as far as I can see. Yes, but uh, he was demanding. Um, and, uh, and I, we had to deliver, um, but there were gallows humor of like sitting in his office one night, um, the night that the A-Team premiered and, um, Brandon looked at myself and Jeff Sagansky and he said, if this thing doesn't open, we need to resign tomorrow. Huh. And, and I said, uh, resign? Like, you mean give up our jobs? And he goes, we need to have dignity. They're going to fire us if this thing doesn't work. So we should be ahead of the curve. And I was like, do we all have to do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, the A-team worked and we lived to fight another day. And you were involved with some wonderful shows in the 80s. I, I think you had a lot to do with Cheers getting on the air. Am I right? I was the junior guy on Cheers. Um, and um, it was my learning tree for comedy development. Um, the Charles Brothers and Jimmy Burroughs really kind of took me under their wing and said, watch what we're doing. Now, remember, there was no DNA at NBC for sophisticated adult comedy. Um, it didn't exist on our network. Um, and so Cheers went on. And uh, at the end of the first year, it was the lowest rated show in all of network television. Now, that's and, generally true of ensemble comedies. Am I right? It takes a while to catch on. It takes time, even in that day and age when there were only three networks and, and networks ruled the world. Um, but why would anyone who was watching NBC and NBC comedy ever expect that Cheers would be something that they would find there, right? So right, right. We, had, we had to educate an audience. Um, and um, and so after they made the pilot, um, you know, I was a development guy, but they said, we'd like you to stay with the show. And that became the basis for, I think, my education and understanding of how adult comedy could work. And a great um, beginning for your stream of years and years of great judgment and great shows. Yeah, they, they, they fed me. Um, and I, I was smart enough to be hungry and listen. And um, I, I could not have had uh, better masters at the game. And, um, and so I was very fortunate that, uh, that I got to work with them. How involved were you with finding Kirstie Alley and Ted Danson and, and also one of the best ensemble casts I've ever seen? I was there for every casting session. Um, and um, we knew um, Fred Dreyer was kind of the, the real competition for Ted Danson. 
Um, and Fred was funny. He was he was good. But Jimmy Burroughs said to us, I'm not sure day in and day out the range of what we want to do. He said, Fred is great, um, but the guy to go the distance is Ted. Um, and we need we need all of his skills. Um, and um, and I think the lesson learned there was when you have a Jimmy Burroughs and you have the Charles brothers, listen to them. And so there was a little bit of like, oh, Fred Dreyer. Um, there was that buzz. And yet we listened to the wisdom of our, uh, our producers and our director, our creators. Um, and that was the right call. Uh, Kelsey, uh, you know, Kelsey came in and read and, um, and he owned it. Uh, he was great. There was a lot of competition for him. And Kelsey Grammer was absolutely unknown, but there was something that was rather surgical in his ability to deliver uh, Frasier, um, the voice of Frasier. Um, and, uh, you know, we made a good call. Now, do you like to audition actors? Are you comfortable, comfortable with it? Because I know for a lot of producers and directors I know, they hate being in a room and anybody's auditioning, and I think they get nervous and scared. How, how do you feel about that? It's exhausting. It's hard to go home at the end of the day and, and have a loved one say, how was your day? And you say, I'm exhausted. I sat in a room and watched actors uh, perform. And they look at you and go, that doesn't sound like a tough day. Um, and um, I think if you're open and exposed, you know, I, I kind of my process is to almost imagine for a moment right before the reading that there's been a scalpel that's literally gone right down vertically down my body and everything is open. And I try and feel as much as I can what's coming out of that performance. And um, it's interesting. I, I Most often for me, when I'm leaning in, uh, excited, turned on, uh, completely captivated, I'm feeling that. And when I'm not feeling a performance, everything kind of shuts down for me. Um, and so um, I like it. I think that it's a difficult process. I think the live in a room is kind of a crazy process. And I love that what we've turn that into now is um, we we hire today so many actors who self tape um, or they go into reading sessions with a casting director um, and and, um, and it's and it's basically sit and look at it um, you many times we do callbacks but the idea of walking into a room filled with executives where your life can change in that moment in that room, I think that that puts all kinds of burdens on the process that should not be. I think one thing, I, I'm an actor and sometimes I'm directing people, and I think it's, it's very easy for actors to forget that most people who are watching you at your audition are hoping and praying that you are the one and they can stop looking for other people. Well, that's it's hard to remember that. It's absolutely true. It's the same thing when a writer comes in to pitch a show and you need to remind yourself that your network's future, your future can be when this creator opens their mouth, it may be the turnaround show for your network, right? And so are you gonna be on top of your game and hear it and see it with an actor are you going to receive the gold that could possibly be there? And, you know, so much of what you do is go, no, you say no a lot. Um, so you really have to be um, on your game and have, I think, your antenna needs to be up for, you know what, there might be something wonderful here. Well, it's great to have that attitude and actors feel it when the people who are watching them are really caring. It's, it's, it's pretty magical when it's good. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Now, you orchestrated 
of the renaissance at NBC and you nurtured a never to be seen again state of through the roof hit scene, hit series. And I'm going to mention a series and you tell me anything you want to say about it. Okay. All right. It's sort of like 20,000 questions. Seinfeld, go. Seinfeld. Um, one of the few memories from my, uh, from my history of NBC is right up here behind me. And I've always kept this close by. It's the original research report from the Seinfeld Chronicles. And overall evaluation, weak. Uh, <laughs> they, <laughs> the test audience hated it. They knew who Jerry Seinfeld was. They just didn't like the show. And they said, these people are awful human beings. Um, and so for the final night of uh, filming of Seinfeld, um, I took original copies of the research report and I got the cast to sign it and Larry David. And, um, and I keep it framed to remind myself that um, it's not painting by the numbers. Um, right. Breaking rules, doing things that scare you um, are really important. Um, failure is really important to understand when you've gone too far and the audience rejects. Um, what's important is not to fail all the time, but to learn from your mistakes. And Seinfeld just broke all the rules. Um, you know, I, uh, <laughs> I remember saying to Larry, um, for the Chinese restaurant episode, there's no story. Don't tell <laughs> the story. And Larry was so offended. Um, and and you you played cards with Larry. You know Larry. Well, yeah. Um, and, and and yet, what Jerry said is, they may not get what we're trying to do with this episode, but they're letting us do it. And so, and that was the wonderful yin and yang of of that team is um, Jerry believed that the glass was half full um, and Larry thought that it was empty. And, and <laughs> Not even half empty. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and, um, and together they made brilliance. Uh, so that was, uh, and they broke all the rules of storytelling in a half hour comedy. Yes, a show about nothing. Show about nothing as you, Bob Balaban, um, uh, standing in yet again for me um, in memorable episodes of uh, Seinfeld. I love it. Well, I was on the last episode of the first season, and I think somebody said to me, this show is in 86th place for how many <laughs> people were watching it. Yeah. And I came back and I got, went home and nobody noticed me or thought about it. You know, I didn't hear about anything. I was on a couple of episodes the next season. And I believe it was you who decided to change the night and the time. And immediately you were in the top 10. Am I wrong? You were correct. Um, Larry, I, I said, well, we were losing cheers. I think the important thing here is that the lesson learned in cheers is we believed in it and it wasn't about the ratings. It was about what are you going to stand for? What are you going to believe in? And Grant Tinker helped instill that quality in us. Um, uh, respect the audience, good things will happen. And so the lesson learned in Cheers was then applied to Seinfeld of, do we love this? We do. Do we have anything better than this? We do not. So that's it. Keep it going. And so then when I said to Larry, well, look, Cheers is leaving. I'm going to put you on Thursday night. And Larry's like, well, if they didn't watch us when we were on Wednesday getting a 19, I don't want those people. <laughs> they, don't, they, they don't deserve us. That's so Larry. It's so Larry. And, uh, and uh, um, we, in the final season of Cheers, we put Seinfeld behind it. And, bef and so you're now in the countdown to those final episodes of Cheers. Seinfeld just went in for that final run and they eclipsed in the numbers, they eclipsed Cheers. And that's where Jimmy Burroughs called me and said, I don't think we wanted this to end, but I think maybe it is time. And look what they just accomplished with Seinfeld. They surpassed us. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. How about Friends? What was How that? about Friends? Yeah. Well, we had been playing with that target for a while. 
um, we wanted to do that, that experience of a young, young adults leaving the nest of family and being out on their own. And the whole idea was that if you were doing it with someone else, maybe it would be a little easier. Um, and wow, we developed the number of scripts that were awful and never made a pilot. Um, but we believed in that target. Um, and, and so when uh, Mark Kaufman and David Crane came in and said, this is our story. Um, and it was hilarious. They had a tremendous vision and we were smart enough to say yes. Um, and um, it started, that was a high week in testing. Um, and, but young adults got it. They immediately understood the sensibility. And so we put it on Thursday night and uh, the rest was history. Um, a brilliantly executed soap opera that was wildly funny. And were the friends actually friends? I always wanted to know. Yeah, they, they were. They loved each other. You know, we had done a, a few pilots uh, and a short-lived series with Jennifer. Um, we, um, we the, the, when we went out into the marketplace with that script, the town went crazy. They sensed out there. And it's the first kind of indication when you're in the casting process of whether you have something. Right. And agents were, you have to see, I have this young client. And, uh, you know, unlike other networks that banked more on, um, familiar names um, and established stars. Uh, we really like the idea that television makes stars and that there's a sense of discovery. Um, and so the idea that we had this bright, fresh, young, funny ensemble of young adults um, and they immediately bonded. Um, and Jimmy Burroughs uh, did the pilot, brought them all together and um, and Martin David understood how to write something that was wildly entertaining and emotionally compelling. Wow. How did you get such great chemistry? Did you test the actors with each other? How did it come to be that there were so many wonderful relationships and they weren't always even written into the parts? They just had great relationships. We were lucky. We were lucky. They. Um, they read individually. You know, we had, they, they, we each role, they read individually. Um, and then um, once, uh, once we shot the pilot and Jimmy was so good about creating a safe environment where they could bond. And then uh, we shot the pilot and then Jimmy uh, flew them all on a private jet to uh, Vegas. Wow and said, you'll never be able to do this again. And we're just going to have a night playing in Vegas. And, uh, and, and uh, that'll be that. And, uh, and it, it exploded. I mean, it, 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 a little bit of time to catch on, but it exploded and it became the monster, the most successful comedy in the history of comedy um, throughout the world. Uh, it's generated uh, more viewers, more income. Uh, nothing has surpassed it. I remember David Schwimmer's mother doing something for the cast that I was never sure if it was apocryphal or real. But am I right that she made it? She convinced everybody's agents that everybody should get the same money? Well, she was a powerful divorce attorney. Um, and she had a lot of wisdom, um, but it wasn't really um, his mom who was carrying that water. It was David. Oh. David. David came out of a theater background in Chicago. Um, and David believed that regardless of that, they came into the show at different levels. Uh, you know, deals were made based upon who they were or who they weren't at that time. And when, when it was clear that it was a big hit and the idea was let's redo these deals and get more years uh, for the show, 
Um, David said, we'll never survive what's happening in our lives with this unless we're equal. And it's an ensemble and that's how we need to be treated. And it ended up being um, not only the right thing to keep them together for a decade, but it ended up being a brilliant strategy because of course, the business people at Warner's and NBC, you always pick people off and therefore make a deal and then say, well, we have so-and-so and, and it, they were united. They had to be treated as one and their ship rose accordingly. Um, they deserved it all, but um, every one of those cast members uh, walked away being in, let's just say enormously, enormously wealthy. Wow. And that all goes back to that strategy that David had, because multiple times they were able to renegotiate uh, for that. And, and the that, power of negotiation when the entire cast is negotiating is real power. Muscle. Absolutely. And a hit show. Um, and then Marta and David um, uh, also understood that the reason that they had a hit was because of that cast. And so none of them had back end points when they were hired and throughout several renegotiations, Martin and David shared. They shared so that they were truly partners uh, and, you know, life changing differences for all of them. I think Marta was a babysitter for my kids when she was very young in, in acting school. Was she good at that? Yeah, she was great. Oh, I never heard about it. Oh, good. I love that. How about Frazier? Well, you know, I was scared to death. Um, my the only thing that when I was, you know, had gotten the big job at NBC to run the entertainment division, the only thing that still was alive on that schedule was Cheers. And then Ted said, it's been great and it's time to go. And um, so I was desperate to have um, something come out of Cheers. And um, you know, there was talk about, well, should it be um, uh, uh, a spinoff for, um, uh, uh, oh, God, uh, God, Cliff and Norm, right? A Cliff right. and Norm spinoff. Right. And, and at the end of the day, we thought that the character that had weight and, and uh, could really be the center of something, not delightful, brilliant, um, comedic sidebar, but who could carry us? We really felt that that was Frazier and, and Kelsey. And so um, wonderfully, um, Casey, Angel, and Lee created a family comedy. Um, and they said, we know if it's in Boston, you're going to make us do episodes back at the Cheers bar. We'll never have our own identity. We're going to Seattle, We're going as far away as we can right. uh, so that you won't be tempted. And I was like, fair enough. And and so they constructed a wonderful adult sibling. Two brothers having to figure out how to deal with their retired dad. And um, when it was pitched, we had the cast done in the pitch. Um, we knew exactly who we wanted, what we wanted to do, and and just went out and executed it. And that was a magical night. And I actually, I felt on stage that night that maybe I could hold on to my job because Frasier was going to be a, a, a pretty wonderful comedy um, and that I could survive uh, losing cheers. Now, it sounds like in a way you built the show around Frasier and the, and the actor. Do you often... Or do you ever find an actor that you love so much and have no idea what you're going to do with him and build something around him or her? Does that happen? I think usually what you fall in love with talent. I do all the time. Um, but I think it's also finding what's the um, what's the creative thrust. What do you want to say? What is it? Where does it want to live? So I think it's more about what goes hand in hand is. Um, it's really finding a, a path that sets you in motion. That you need the you need the north star as well as the talent. 
Right. Yeah. Did you have the same casting director for years or did it change? And who was your casting director? I don't remember the NBC casting director. Well, um, for Cheers, it was Joel Thurm. And then um, shortly after that, Joel left and Laurie Openden um, was running casting for NBC for more than a decade and uh, brilliantly guided us through so many of those must-see TV uh, shows. Um, and um, really always encouraged me to take chances. Um, you know, she, I, I, I trusted her instincts. When I doubted mine, I listened to her. Um, and, um, and then after uh, a long run at NBC, then she went and discovered a whole new generation of talent for the uh, CW network and did that for a decade and recently retired. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And wow, did she was a career maker. Um, yeah, that's, not. that's a great boon for a network to have somebody with that kind of taste and somebody you like and agree with, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, magical. Brilliant. Now, were, the, were you aware of casting directors at other networks? Did they do things the way you did it or is it was was NBC unique in discovering well, new talent? Well, I, I think because we, we like that sense of discovery, I think we were somewhat unique. CBS was always more traditional um, and went for more name names. And, and they had an, an older audience and, and they catered to that. Um, uh, and um, I'm not as aware of, of any of our competition. I think we... We liked what we were doing and focused on doing that well. And so that's kind of where we lived. Now, in 1998, in your final year, oh, by the way, did Law & Order begin under your leadership? Yes, Law & Order did. And then uh, Dick Wolf pitched me um, a show called uh, Sex Crimes. And I was like, okay, we're an advertiser supported network. <laughs> I can't, I won't be able to get any advertisers into that, but I think you do have a really interesting idea here. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to make it law and order colon sex crimes or whatever it goes. And that became SVU. Um, and that's a way to use that brand that we've now established Dick and, and, um, and that became the, and I apologize for this, but that became the birth of the procedural spinoff in uh, network television. Um, so it all worked for Dick. Isn't Law & Order still on the air, a version of it? Am I wrong? Yes. No, that's still on. Uh, absolutely. What is that, 23 years? So oh, like yeah, more, more. Yeah. My God. Yeah. Now, also in your last year, the West Wing began. How did that happen? Did you did you create it? Did somebody come to you with the germ of an idea? How did it happen? Um, out of the tremendous success from ER with John Wells, um, I didn't want to lose John Wells to competition, so I made a uh, a pretty big commitment. Um, and, and under that commitment, John brought in Aaron, and Aaron had had his experiences uh, in the West Wing. And that was it. They were sit, sat on the couch and they pitched the show and we were just smart enough to go, OK. And um, and Aaron wrote it, um, wrote a few drafts. And um, one of the last moves I had before I got my exit visa from NBC uh, was I put all the deal together to go forward. And one of my final battles with Don Olmeyer was I said, we're making this. And I'm president of the entertainment division and I get to make that call. And he was like, it'll never work. I don't want to do it. And so we had quite a heated debate and not long after I was gone. And then uh, when a new administration came in, that was one of the first thing they did was they fired it up. But uh, it was my development. So I, I, uh, I take pride in that. 
And uh, it was one of the reasons why I, uh, I was asked to leave. Wow. I never knew that. Yeah. Yeah. But did you ever dream that you would be responsible for so many successful shows for so long? Did it? Did you used to sit around thinking about it or were you too busy to even think? Um, I was kind of too busy to think. And, and I think you don't. Uh, the last thing you want to do is to buy into your own bullshit. I, I think that um, as a network programmer, you're, it's always about, well, that's great. And I would champion, you know, on a Thursday night in the 90s, uh, a third of the, uh, of the country was watching NBC. 75 million people watched NBC on a Thursday night. Um, so that was pretty remarkable. Um, and we, we felt really good about quantity and quality. Um, that was great, but you know, you always have, there's always holes to fill. There's always so much more and, you, and, um, you know, you're slumped over going, ah, but how are we going to fix Friday? Um, and then of course GE owned us and GE showed me a chart and they said, Thursday night is more profitable than all the other nights combined. And I said, how about that? We do a really good job on Thursday. And they go, no, you missed the point. You need more Thursdays. And I go, that's your point? You just wanted me to deliver more Thursdays. Uh -huh. I was like, okay, thank you for the wonderful meeting. Wow. Yeah. Now, I don't know that you would say this about yourself because you don't brag, but why do you have such good managing skills? I've worked with a lot of people. You're easygoing, you're tough, you're smart. You don't do anything quirkily or just to be different. You actually are very centered. And I've never seen you getting get mad. I'm sure you do occasionally, but it's, it's not much in your vocabulary. Yeah. What was in your background that best prepared you for this kind of skill at management? Was it How did it happen? Well, you know, thank you. Uh, thank you for the those comments. Um, well, it's true. And, you know, one day when I was when I was cast in the HBO movie, The Late Shift, I, I wanted to study you. So I, I think you told me this. I, you said I could sit in your office in the back and be quiet and watch you interviewing and working with other people. And, yeah. it's, and, it, and it, it really taught me a lot in your calmness and the straightforward nature of it. And I think I scared people, too, by watching. <laughs> that, I think you probably did. Um, you know, I, I think part of it um, was growing up in that household with uh, a number of, of women. Um, and I respected and listened to them. Um, and so I never thought that um, as a male, somehow I should be dominating. I thought I learned, I think, that I should be listening um, and that... Um, and that there was respect. Um, and, and then I studied psychology. You know, I, I had a degree in psychology. And I think my learning to work with other people um, is really about appreciation. And I, I think as a network guy and then also as a producer, my job is to have my eyes open to find vision. And I don't have to have the vision, but I need to be able to identify it. And then when I identify it, I need to nurture it and I need to protect it. And so I've gotten to this place in my life where companies are willing to give me lots of money where they make bets on what I can make because they see that I'm able to take that vision and then build with a number of other visionaries around it and put something cohesive together that audiences value. And, and so that's not being the loudest voice in the room. That's listening, understanding, and finding community of artists. That's really satisfying to me. I mean, I like that. I, I don't need I don't need the click light to be on me, you know, from time to time. It's great. You know, I, I don't mind walking on stage and being able to hold an Emmy, but, but the process for me 
I think is about listening, finding, protecting, nurturing, and then pushing that forward. Well, it's the kind of thing that can't really be taught, but it's, I think it's one of the biggest reasons that you had so much success so early on in your career. And in the, even in the last 20 years, you've continued to have a vibrant career. And there really, you can count on one hand how many people had a career for their whole lives and are still having one. And I'm I, just trying to keep up with Norman Lear. Yes. Yeah. But, but I, I, who was I talking to? Maybe Norman Lear a little while ago. He said, I did all these great shows and I want to do a show about a retirement home. And everybody tells me I'm too old and it can't be done. And yet it was a great idea. And and he's still he's still going. At 100, he's still out there doing what he loves to do. He's amazing. Now, Handmaid's Tale. That's a wonderful show and an unlikely show. I can't imagine how you got it on the air, except it's it's because with the world is a little bit different now. People are willing to accept unusual things. How did it happen? And is it unusual to adapt a book to be a series? Have you done that before? Um, well, Fargo uh, was, of course, adapting a movie. But um, Handmaid's Tale, um, MGM had developed uh, a script with um, Eileen Chaikin and they had sold it to Showtime and Showtime passed. MGM went into the marketplace and said, anybody interested? And Hulu said, we're interested in adapting Margaret Atwood's book. Um, we're, we think that that could be a really interesting proposition, but we want we want to start from scratch, and we'll we'll uh, we'll order two scripts, and at, at, with those two scripts, um, we either go to series or not, and so that's where MGM went. And then, you know, of course, in trying to find the writer to adapt it, um, it was actually Hulu and MGM that said, we know Bruce Miller is the wrong sex um, and he um, and his career is not hot, but he has an inspired take on what to do with it. And so the least sexy candidate to uh, adapt The Handmaid's Tale was Bruce Miller. And, wow. they, and they said, let's do it. Now, also, they didn't have this massive penalty over them. So I think it's critical to their brilliance is that they there was no punishment attached. It was just creatively, are we going to take a leap? Are we going to try? Because we heard from this writer a vision and we liked it. And it was better than anybody else we auditioned. And so they did. And then um, they wrote two scripts. Um, and then they wanted um, they wanted Lizzie Moss. How did they know about her? Was, was, had they worked with her before? They hadn't worked with her, but of course, um, Mad Men, Lizzie ha Lizzie's star had risen throughout oh. the arc of that series, um, and they coveted her. And then Lizzie's reps um, were like, "Yeah, well." They're not getting they're not getting Lizzie Moss. And so I had just recently gone to WME and um, and so Ari Greenberg at WME said to Lizzie's WME reps, um, well, what if I brought the guy who did Fargo and Sharon Jackson, who uh, Sharon Jackson, um, uh, was a part of Lizzie's life, and and Ari knew that that Fargo was like her favorite show, and so um, basically they said, okay, um, Warren, uh, call Lizzie Moss. She's doing a limited series in Australia. You get on the phone with her and convince her that you are her partner in doing this. And by the way, make sure she doesn't get director approval. And so oh. I I'd never met Lizzie. Um, we spent a few hours on the phone 
And I said, look, I'm prepping another Fargo and um, I don't have to do this, but I think Bruce captured something that's pretty powerful. And um, if you do it, I'll be there for you, right? Um, I will be there late at night and early in the morning. And um, cause I think this is worth fighting for. And, um, and so if you do it, I'll do it. And Lizzie said, I think we have to do it. I, I, I think I'm gonna be really upset if I don't do it. And I want your help in, in putting this together. And I said, great. Now about that director thing. Um, and I said, look, I'm never going to hire a director without your approval. Nobody wants to put it in the contract. So this is the first test. Will you trust me? And she said, yes. And that's it. Then it, it's become a wonderful triangle of trust with Lizzie Moss, Bruce Miller, and myself. And, and um, as we often say, we wish that the show is no longer relevant. Um, right. Uh, and sadly, it becomes more and more relevant um, uh, each and every year. So, well, her agents must have been pretty happy with the way it turned out after wanting her not to do it, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's been a phenomenal, phenomenal story. And Lizzie's turned into being a hell of a director. Um, she directed three of the 10 episodes this year. Um, season four, she directed four. Um, uh, I believe that, uh, that she deserved that opportunity and, um, and she seized it. But don't you think she's a kind of an actress who can actually do anything? She can be funny. She can be sexy. She can be, and she can be anything, but I didn't know that until I saw this show. Yeah, it's so true. Um, I never count out Lizzie Moss. Um, she, uh, and it's, she does the work, whether, whether it's preparing for her scene for the next day as an actor, um, whether it's prepping as a director, no one else does the, the legwork for her. Uh, she's there, she's present day after day, night after night, um, an amazing, creative work ethic. And she didn't audition for this part, right? She just, you got just talked. Yep. Yeah. Was that, a, was, that a, was that a little scary for you or could you tell in I, your heart? Yeah. Uh, I, uh, the moment we shot the first scene with her and um, the camera intimately came into her face and she had no dialogue. It was just what she was telling us. Um, with her face as she sat back backlit in that window seat in the uh, attic room. And I was just like, yeah, this works. Um, and so uh, uh, zero doubt. And, and, and then it was when we looked at the first cut, the first assembly, um, uh, yes, we knew going in that Lizzie was gonna work. It was just creating this dystopia um, that all of that would work because MGM had done a really bad movie in the early nineties. Um, uh, and of the book. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, lots of bad decisions, but we looked at that early cut and said, this feels powerful. I'm connected to June and June's journey. Um, and if June doesn't give up, against these overwhelming odds, then that gives me the strength to carry on and to watch that journey with her. Well, there's your psychology coming back again, right? Yeah, maybe. And you've just wrapped production, I believe, on the old man for FX? Yes. Can you, yes. And can you tell me a little bit about how you roped in Jeff Bridges, who'd never done a TV series as far as I know, right? That's right, yeah. Um, his the last television he did uh, was uh, when he was a teenager, um, uh, just doing a little walk on thing with his with his dad show. Um, mm -hmm. but, but it had been over 50 years um, and uh, that he appeared on television. And um, 
you know, uh, we I took the Thomas Perry book and I believe that there was a wonderful setup um, of uh, basically what's it like to be Jason Bourne 30 years later. And, and it was a guy living in Vermont with his two dogs um, and his past was going to come back to haunt him. Um, and he was going to be on the run and fight for his life and don't count them out. Um, and so that setup we loved. I went to John Steinberg, the only writer I went to, and said, here's the potential. And I think we can deepen this and open it up. Um, and um, I see a series here. We actually spec'd the script. We, uh, we wrote the script. Um, and then with the script, we said, who would be who would be our dream? Like if we could have anyone in the world, who would it be? And we're like, well, Jeff Bridges would have to be the top of the list. And then I started engaging with Jeff, Jeff's reps and everyone. And, and then we add something to show them, right? And um and and we started a long dance. And Jeff said, look, I I paddle my boat down the river. And I only occasionally pull off to the side for a little stop for where I'm very happy just paddling my boat down the river. And, um, and he said, but this is pretty good. And so we engaged a number of times with Jeff and said, so this is what it looks like. This is what doing a series looks like. And he felt comfortable and safe. And, um, and so we then had Jeff Bridges. We had the uh, script for the first hour and a vision of what the series would be. And, and um, John Langrath read it and said, we're making this series. Um, and so. And did you bring in John Lithgow at that point? Because they're so great together. And, I, and for yeah. an I read about it. Yeah, it was, so, it was very helpful with Jeff. Yeah, I, I had uh, I done Third Rock from the Sun with uh, John Lithgow and love him, and we needed someone from from Jeff's past, right? Dan Chase's past, who could challenge him and and duel with him, um, and so much of that um in uh, the early episodes is they're never in a scene together it's they're on the phone um so they're never working together so when we finally put them together it was insane they it was such a love story and of course the story of old man is it took two and a half years to do seven episodes we were shut down by covid as for six months and then jeff got cancer and then with cancer treatments he then contracted COVID and we nearly lost him. Um, it was uh, it was very touching up. And so he made it. And, and so imagine a soulful man like Jeff Bridges having survived COVID cancer. And we come back to work to finish. Um, we did a shortened season instead of 10, we did seven. And it was it was such an incredible experience to be all back together again. Ninety percent of the crew from two and a half years earlier came back. They just wanted to be a part of it. And uh, it was magical. And so our partners who could have written the whole thing off, there were lots of discussions about, will this be a write off? Will it ever come back to life? Um, and um, they were patients. And then we put it out there and our patients uh, their patience was rewarded uh, because it was uh, we ended up numbers that FX hasn't experienced in a decade on the linear network and also an explosion on Hulu as well. So um, patience rewarded for good partners. And uh, I just heard the pitch out for season two today. Wow. Yeah, I, I love the show and I'm so glad there's going to be more of it. I, th I, I can't wait to see it. Thank you. So what's it like to work with your son in your company? 
did did was he there from the beginning? No, he, he probably wasn't uh, old enough. He uh, he went well. Graham um, came out of SC and then he uh, USC um, in communications, and then Graham navigated to acting, and so he was doing a um, acting school in a three-year program. And then he was out from time to time, like getting a role here, a role there. Um, and he was in that early baby steps. And I'd said to him, so, I, I, you know, I believe in, in you and and if this is what you want to do then that's fine um i also want to mention though that you know when i'm out there in the marketplace i'm at hulu i'm at uh you know i'm i'm at fx i'm at all these places and i'm i'm seeing a community of young people who love this medium and they're no more articulate they're no more passionate about the medium than you are. The difference is uh, they have a job <laughs> and, oh. and they have community. And, and I, I, I'm not here to be critical of your choice of being an actor, but I think you thrive off of community. And I, you know, I, I, I wonder if you should also consider you know, some of the, because every time I would go to Hulu, you would go, now don't forget when you go there, ask to see so-and-so because I went to school with her and she's one of my good friends and make sure you say hi. And everywhere I would go, like Graham knew people. And I said, well, does this make sense? So I made that, I made that little mini speech and he said, you know what? Um, I think you're right. I'm going to start working for you next week. Well, wow. And I said, well, no, no, I, I actually thought that you should. Yeah. And he said, no, I'm going to come work for you. <laughs> and, and, and what's wonderful is um, he doesn't listen to me. He has, he's very opinionated. He does, um, he, he's really great eye for, for actors, really understands and can identify um, who's right in what role, um, great understanding of directing. Um, and, um, and now we get to have adventures together. Uh, last week we were in Berlin prepping for, um, a new dramatic, uh, show that we're doing for FX called the Benz. And, um, so I'm, I was running around day and night scouting locations in, in Berlin with him. And I gotta say, it's a it's a pinch me experience. He still doesn't listen to me at all. Um, but I kind of love that. I don't need to be surrounded by people that listen to me. I, I does he remind you of yourself a little bit? He's a stronger version of me. Huh. He's uh, he's he's more decisive, has uh, stronger opinions than I do. I came to it slowly. I think I was. I, I think he has a better background in all of it than I did. Right. You know, and so I slowly, out of making lots of mistakes, I, I slowly got more confident and understood um, where I wanted to come from, what I wanted to do. And I think he just, um, he found that a lot faster than I did. Well, he had you to, you to pattern after too. Well, maybe. I'll take a little credit, not too much. Now you're still happily married, I believe, to your wonderful wife of many decades. Teresa. Yes, yes, over forty years together. Um, we met on the decamp bus commuting uh, from New Jersey into our jobs in Manhattan, um, and uh, yeah, that, that's it, she. She has nothing to do with the business. She's a horse whisperer, and. Um, has a very dusty, dirty existence and loves that she works with animals. How great that you're not in the same business. It's, I think it's very hard when there, a couple is in the same profession. I think it's unique. I don't think it's easy. I, I, I think that's right. And I, I think navigating all of that is, is difficult. Um, 
she has a passion for um, and pride in in what I do and Graham does. Um, but uh, but yes, there's no competition. What's next? What's next? Well, I just teased you with um, with Berlin. With Berlin, yes. Um, with uh, uh, the first hour will be. Um, Sardinia and and then Berlin. So yeah, that's kind of wonderful. Uh, family drama, uh, but also a crime thriller that examines at a higher level um, the corruption of international banking and what that's doing to destroy the world that we live in. Um, so I'm very excited about that. Um, we just finished uh, this week, we finished Handmaid's Five, um, I, next week I'll be in Calgary prepping Fargo five. Wow. Um, and, um, and we just have, uh, uh, the story broken for the old man too. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, uh, we're, we're doing things that we believe in that we love. Um, Emmys are coming up. So let's, uh, Let's hope that the special basket to the show. Yeah, let's hope that uh, Dope Sick um, gets the appreciation that I think it deserves. So far, with fourteen nominations, we uh, we're we're honored to have that kind of uh, love and support. Uh, and fantastic and, reviews, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, really, really outstanding. And um, you know, it, it's kind of. Uh, it's what I said to Hulu is HBO learned when they put Chernobyl on that despite that really, really tough, tough story to tell, that audiences came to it because they wanted to understand it. They wanted to understand what happened. Right. Uh, and it was brilliantly executed. And so HBO knew they were doing something great. They just didn't know that that many people would watch it. And they did. And then they got great award ac ac award, awards and ac accolades. And I said, look, that was the most important story of its era. And they brought that to life. This is the story of our time. And that's what we need to and want to do. And God bless Hulu, they said, make us proud. Um, and, and so um, I think with all the awards we've received and a Peabody and and it would be great, the, the Klig light that we could potentially get at an Emmy only says to more people in a world of infinite content and massive amounts of great choices, you know what, maybe I should check that out. I think the more people that see it understand the mistakes that were made and appreciate um, that we need to give dignity and honor that the victims it's not their fault. Um, they were um, they were abused by a corrupt system, and that's important to share with the world. So, so I'm hoping that we get um, even more click lights uh, coming up in September, and um, that more people see it because I think it's uh, it's an important uh, project to be seen. Well, you've never done anything the same twice. You 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 find constantly different interesting situations and characters but is there something in common when you get excited about something is there a core reason that 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 helps you choose what to do is there something that that you look for well um our job i think is to entertain but i also am not afraid of enlighten um and I, there are other companies that will certainly do more volume. Um, we, we try and go quality first. Um, and, um, you know, I've, I've done content that's consumed by masses and that's exciting. That's great. Um, I, I just think it's quality first right now. And so I, I ask myself, would I want to watch that? Um, do I, your biggest upside is if you can step into something that other people are not doing, that it separates itself. 
It's a fog cutter, right? In a world of infinite choice. And so those are the kinds of things I look for. And also artists with vision. I want to work with people that make me feel like I'm still growing as an artist. Right. You know, I, I, I try and surround myself with people who are far more talented than I am. And, uh, and that makes it exciting for me. Um, and, and, and then I think, you know, our gray, our gray, um, you know, corporations believe that, that I will be responsible with their money. So they, they give us trust. They give us massive amounts of money to mount these productions. And, um, and we do that responsibly and we do it well. And I, I like that trust and I like that, that relationship that we have, but they go, go. I mean, it, it's Hulu saying, make us proud, right? I, you, I can't ask for more than that. You know, um, I had uh, Jordan Hellman, who is um, uh, the, the lead uh, developer and programmer at, at Hulu uh, for original content. And, you know, I was we were we were about to go forward on something. And Jordan said, I'm not sure I see this director doing this. I'm I'm I really don't get it, but I I'm afraid to say no to you. Hmm. And, and I said, Jordan, you're our partner and you absolutely can say no. What I prefer is to figure out if I can connect with you on why we're so excited that this director can bring this to life. That's what I want to try and have happen. So let's engage in that. And then, you know, you may use your veto or you may not. And, and ultimately he did. And he's like, you have to make sure that that this that this artist is a part of the series. And I was like, yes, because you bet on them. Yes, that's what we'll do. And and I think we love that. Like that's the most exciting thing is when it's not tried and true. And by the way, I I I bow to the experience of Jeff Bridges, John Lithgow, Michael Keaton. Um but it's also exciting when uh, when you put John Huckenauer in uh, in Dope Sick and people right. go, who who's that guy? Are you ever going to write another book? What do you? Uh, think? It's a lot of work. Oh, I, I would only do it if you would do the audio version, Bob, which I continue to be indebted to you for always. But uh, I don't know. It's uh, when I sold the book. I, I was like, ah, this is fun. And it, it's hard. It's a lot of work. So it was really fun reading. And I have to tell you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know. I, I like right now what's on my plate and what I'm doing. Um, I don't think I have time. Um, so uh, we'll see. I never say never. But uh, right now I'm loving what I'm doing. And my plate is pretty full. Um, and I also love that. If you could adapt any movie in the world, what movie would you adapt? So I was crazy enough to do Fargo, right? Where all my friends said, bad idea. Um, but I think what would be fascinating would be to take the French connection and do, it's really the origin story of drug trafficking in America. And go to Marseille, go open that up and and tell that story of how that French cartel changed life for so many people here in this country. Um, so I love the size, scope and, and what that could be. Again, brilliant movie. Maybe it's crazy to touch it, but opening it up. And uh, and finding and I've read the original uh, book that it was based on. Um, uh, opening that up, uh, that I don't know. Uh, it, that could be fun. Sounds like a good idea to me, and it's also another thing you've never come close to doing anything like it. Yeah, yeah, I like it. All right, thank you. 
Well, Warren, it's been wonderful picking your brain and talking to you. I thank you. And I'm so glad we got to see each other because it's been forever. It has been. And uh, I, I really, I love, I love you. I admire you. Um, I really cherish our friendship. And um, thank you so much, Bob, for being so generous with your time and, um, and uh, grilling me tonight. I loved it. Well, I loved hearing you. It was great. And it was the most we've ever spoken to each other in one sitting. So <laughs> hooray for that. Hooray for that, indeed.